Well, good afternoon, everyone, and it's so wonderful to be with all of you. Welcome to the Rise and Fall of Diabetes, the latest installment of our virtual expedition series, where we take you behind the scenes of the University of Alberta Hospital site and introduce you to some of the incredible clinicians and researchers who are doing amazing things right here in Edmonton. My name is Carolyn Thompson, and I'm the Director of Philanthropy for the University Hospital Foundation. I would like to first acknowledge that we are located on Treaty 6 territory and respect the histories, languages, and culturals of First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and all First People of Canada, whose presence continue to enrich our vibrant community. I would like to remind you that today's session is being recorded and we will send the link to the recording to everyone who has responded to our invitation over the next few days. As you watch the presentations and questions arise, we invite you to submit them to the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. A Q&A session will follow the presentation where your questions will be answered. And before we introduce our, our presenter, I would like to take a moment to tell you about the University Hospital Foundation, who we are, what we do, and most importantly, why we do it. We believe that life is better when you're healthy. As agents of hope, we strive to match the determination and intensity of the medical teams we support. Over the past 10 years, generosity from individuals and corporate partners have contributed nearly $220 million towards bringing some of the best care in the world to our communities, and likewise sharing innovative medical discoveries with the rest of the world. Through our donors, we provide ongoing financial support to advance patient care, create new knowledge, and make breakthrough discoveries at one of the leading academic medical centers in Western Canada. So diabetes recently earned a spot in the top 10 causes of death worldwide. If that doesn't, if that doesn't get your attention, consider that roughly one quarter of the Alberta population is diabetic or pre-diabetic. And as you may have guessed, that number is on the rise. But thanks to the work of Dr. James Sapiro and his team of researchers, this frightening rise of diabetes may be about to fall. For someone living with the, with the disease and for those who know somebody with diabetes, I cannot imagine a more exciting news than that. And as always guiding us through our fascinating journey today is Dr. Jody Abbott, President and CEO of the University Hospital Foundation. Jody. Good afternoon, everyone. I am always inspired by the brilliant people whose work we support through our donors, and Dr. Shapiro is certainly no exception. I'm also inspired by the story of someone named Brent Smithson of Lloyd Minster. Don't worry if that name doesn't ring a bell. It's not supposed to. Brent is a regular, everyday Albertan. But his courage and poise stand as symbols of the strength and determination needed to beat this terrible disease. 44 years ago, at the prime age of 24, Brent was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. He was attending classes at the University of Saskatchewan at the time with an eye on a career in medicine. He and his wife were also expecting their first child. For the next 40 plus years, Brent lived with daily insulin injections, half a dozen or more finger pricks a day to test his blood sugar levels, and the constant worry that those levels would drop again to a point where we would have to take another trip to the hospital. None of that stopped Brent from living his life. To avoid the exhaustive training predictable hours of the medical profession, and to ensure he could provide for his family, Brent switched his career path from medicine to working in the trades. He and his wife had three children and they had lived a comfortable, happy life. Despite living with an incurable disease, he was making the most of it. Then in 2017, something new happened. The shivers and cold sweats that served as warning signs that his sugar levels were low stopped. They were replaced by terrifying seizures in the middle of the night, 
and even during the day at work. That is when Brent's doctor put him in touch with Dr. Shapiro at the University of Alberta. To qualify for the diabetes research that Dr. Shapiro was doing at the time, Brent and his family moved from the Saskatchewan side of Lloydminster to the Alberta side. Soon after, Brent met the criteria for an islet cell transplant procedure that was developed right here at the U of A in 2000 by a team of researchers led by Dr. Shapiro. On January 25th, 2022, Brent received his third and final islet cell transplant. He has not received an insulin injection since, nor has he had to check his blood sugar levels. That's pretty amazing. In other words, his diabetes has effectively been cured. But there's more to this story. The procedure Brent received is known around the world as the Edmonton Protocol, and it has changed the lives of hundreds of people living with diabetes. But it's not quite perfect. Like all transplant surgeries, islet cell transplants are reliant upon donors. And as you may recall from our last virtual expedition, organ and tissue donors of all kinds are in short supply. There's also the matter of what occurs after receiving an islet cell transplant. Recipients like Brent must take anti-rejection medication for the rest of their lives. The research that Dr. Shapiro is going to share with you today resolves both of these issues and opens the door to the very real possibility that a cure for diabetes is within our reach. Not only that, it's within our lifetime. When Carolyn mentioned that we are agents of hope, this is what she was referring to. By supporting the work of Dr. Shapiro, donors to the University Hospital Foundation are bringing hope to millions of people around the world that a cure for diabetes is coming. If that strikes you as research worth knowing about and possibly even supporting, you're in the right place. It now gives me great pleasure to introduce our special guest. Dr. James Sapiro is a transplant surgeon at the University of Alberta Hospital, a professor in the Faculty of Medicine and Dentistry at the University of Alberta, and a world leader in diabetes research. Dr. Shapiro, we are so happy to have you with us today. The virtual floor is yours. Jody, uh, friends, good afternoon, and thank you so much for this opportunity. First and foremost, to say thank you, a huge thank you to the University Hospital Foundation for supporting our work and allowing us to take one big stride uh, forward uh, together. Okay, well, the rise and fall of diabetes a virtual expedition, a journey together. Well, we just recently celebrated 100 years since the discovery, the amazing Canadian discovery of insulin, and it all began by an idea. Frederick Banting wrote this in his notebook on October the 31st, 1920, Sunday night, middle of the night, just preparing for a lecture. He was too tired, as you can see, to spell diabetes correctly. He had this idea of ligating the pancreatic duct in dogs that would allow him and his team eventually to get more insulin out from a pancreas and allow a new treatment for patients. A hundred years later, we celebrate with a Canadian stamp. Insulin is a life-saving treatment, but it is not a cure for diabetes. Now, the idea of transplanting cells to replace the need for insulin is not new. So it should have been around about 50 years or so, maybe even longer, because people were trying to do uh, transplants with, with human and, and, and sheep pancreas cells back over 100 years ago, before the discovery of insulin. But this scientist, Paul E. Lacey, uh, second from last author there, uh, discovered that if you put islets into the vein inside the liver, he could eliminate the need for the antirejection drugs in, in mice. And this was the discovery, essentially, that cell transplants could work as a, as a treatment. Why do we need something better than an ins insulin injection? Why do we need that when we've got modern insulins, we've got insulin pumps, we've got closed-loop monitoring wearable systems 
Well, the reason is this. When we inject insulin under the skin, be it an injection or a pump, it's far from perfect. It sits there under the skin. This is a CT scan, high resolution, greatly magnified of an injection of insulin below the skin. There's a needle track there. It sits there. The body absorbs it in a variable fashion, and it just cannot provide the perfect, precise sugar control that's needed to regulate blood sugar in a completely normal range. As a result of that, Every single six seconds that goes by, one person dies from the complications of this disease. As you heard, there are massive numbers of patients across the world that have this. 463 million today, 700 million by 2045. And a quarter of our Alberta population today, 29% by 2031, have this disease. It's a huge, huge problem. It's the most expensive of all the diseases we take care of. We spend in Alberta, uh, $475 million per year in direct costs in managing this disease, and that's going to rise inexorably. Across the world, every single year, we spend $1.3 trillion in managing this disease and its complications. We need something better. We need a biological solution to a biological disease. And here I'm showing you the kind of control, blood sugar control, that can be attained with a transplant of islet, of islet cells in a patient, just like Brent. Rock studied, studied blood sugar control. Before a transplant, Brent would have had wild excursions in his blood sugar, despite everything he was doing. Uh, but this cell transplant can regulate blood sugar because it releases insulin in exactly the amount that the body needs. When the, when the blood sugar rises, more insulin is pulsed out. When the blood sugar falls, another hormone is, is pumped out, and this can regulate the blood sugar and essentially lock it in range. So we began this experiment, I suppose you could call it, in 1999 on March the 11th. This was the beginning of the Edmonton Protocol in a very uh, basic uh, basement lab at that time. And I have to say, at that time, people had tried this before. There had been around 300 islet transplants attempted, but very few of them ever reached the point where a patient could discontinue insulin injections. So we published our first seven patients, all of whom were able to come off insulin. That was published in July 2000 in the New England Journal of Medicine. There's been a lot of advances in, in this field since then. The techniques used for isolating the islets from the human pancreas organs, and as you heard, there's a scarcity of organ donors. There'll never be enough organ donors across the world to save the patients who need this with diabetes. So we need another solution as well as this. But up till now, we've depended very much on these organ donors. And we use this system developed by a friend and colleague of mine, Camilla Ricordi, who now works at the University of Miami. And he developed a system. We have a lab here in Edmonton, an ultra clean room, what's called a GMP lab that prepares human islet cells that are derived from pancreas organs that are flown all across the country by our HOPE program program and our, our coordinators that, that really help help this for, 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 our, for our patients. So here we are preparing the cells, uh, extracting the islets, and, and I, I don't take credit for this, there's an amazing team that, that's led by Dr. Tatsia Kin, Doug O'Gorman, and their colleagues that, that, that process this. There's a huge amount of regulation, as you can imagine, with, with preparation of these cells. And we recently published in, in Diabetes uh, all of the recipes that are involved with that, together with my co colleague uh, Camilla Ricordi. This is the transplant. It's a cell transplant that's carried out without the need for any surgery. There's no in incision needed. A needle is placed in the side with the patient awake on the x-ray table. And, the, and our experts in radiology, interventional radiology doctors, infuse these cells. It takes about 20 minutes to do this. And at the end, they're very careful to plug the tract with this special kind of powder that prevents any bleeding from, from the liver. And this is sort of the map of where these cells go inside the liver. So we moved on and we carried out a number of trials. This is one of them, the International Multicenter Trial of the Edmonton Protocol that we published in 2006 in the New England Journal of Medicine. And this is the person that discovered islet transplants in, in mice. And this is me carrying out the 100th islet transplant in Edmonton. I'll let Paulie Lacey have a word on, on his feelings about the Edmonton Protocol. We're still off insulin. No one had any idea what was going on. But there is a young man in Canada, Edmund, Canada, James Shapiro and his associates had an idea what to do. They tried it, it worked. The next, and I'm very, very proud of him for what he's done because he rejuvenated the area and the field of islet transplantation. That was the very last lecture that Paulie Lacey gave just three weeks before he died. 
So today we celebrate 20 years of changing lives of patients with, di with diabetes, with this amazing program that's uh, supported by Alberta Health Services. And I, I don't take credit for this. There's an, an amazing team of, of individuals involved with this, and this is just some of them that have, that have helped move this field forward. And we couldn't have done this without the government's support and without Alberta Health Services supporting this, this uh, clinical team. We've also trained a large number of clinical transplant fellows, surgeons and, and scientists and, and other clinicians uh, who have gone across the world to practice islet transplant and improve the lives of patients with, with transplant, organ transplant surgeries. And we're very proud of these individuals that have been able to achieve so much in their own way. So this is our paper we published a couple of weeks ago in, the, in one of the Lancet journals describing our 20-year experience. And I'll just briefly walk you through uh, some of that. It's, it's a very complex, uh, heavy analysis paper. I wouldn't recommend re reading it unless you want to nod off early at night, but it's, 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 it's a wonderful paper actually. And, and Braulio Marfil Garza put this together uh, with me. And it basically shows that over the course of 20 years, this is the amount of insulin, another word for insulin, C-peptide, is being produced by the patients across 20 years of, of, of follow-up, an, an amazing result. And as a result of that, we can prevent the dangerous lows in blood sugar that a patient would experience. And this is a scoring system for those lows, sky high before a transplant, rock steady low, very, very close to zero across to almost 20 years after a transplant. So we can achieve so much. And here's another patient, Nina, together with her husband, Brent, who's enjoying being off insulin, having very stable sugar control. Every morning she wakes up feeling optimistic. And, and I think all of our team takes a great, great um, knowledge in the fact that we're, we're changing people's lives every day. We're very grateful for that opportunity. 78% of patients are able to achieve periods of insulin independence after an islet transplant. Now, this doesn't last forever, but certainly we can achieve that for a period of time in over three quarters of our patients treated. We discovered, here's an example of a laboratory experiment that we did and published 12 years ago in the American Journal of Transplantation, where we gave two antibodies, one's called anakinra, one's called etanercept, these two injections. They're given to patients that have rheumatoid arthritis and other inflammatory conditions. What we found in, in the lab was when we gave those two antibodies together, we could really improve the survival of human islets when we transplanted them into mice. And when we looked at the cell death rate, it was dramatically lower. This one in the third column there was almost close to zero. So we moved that from, from the lab to the clinic. And what we found in this, this paper that we published was that, that when we used those two antibodies, we could improve the function of the islet transplant seven and a half times. And, that, and we were very pleased to see something translate so positively from, from mice to, to, to people. So very positive outcome. This is a marker of how good the blood sugar control is in all of our patients across 20 years, showing that this marker A1C, the higher it is, when it's up here, eight, nine, tens, the faster patients get complications, uh, end-stage kidney disease, blindness, strokes, amputations. If we can keep it down in this normal range, we can have a big impact on preventing those complications. So we take great, great uh, pleasure, I guess, in seeing a graph like this, knowing that we can impact the disease state over the course of time. This is showing the patient's survival, and many of these patients are in their 60s or 70s when we first transplant them. So 74% patient survival at 20 years in this condition indicates that we are achieving remarkable, remarkable results. And, and this is in, even in the context of the anti-rejection drugs. We've carried out a number of large trials together with the National Institutes of Health, the NIH, in the, in the United States. And here's a couple of them here uh, that demonstrate that we can improve the lives of patients, protect them from severe hypoglycemic events. And we've tried to help a number of centers in the United States obtain what's called a biological license of, uh, for them. In the lab, we've tried a number of different approaches too to try and improve the function of these cells. Here's what, one example where we were been placing the islets under the skin in, in, in an experimental model here. What we found is when we put a plastic tube under the skin, we could induce all these new blood vessels that would allow a rich network to allow the cells to, to survive. And just a, a few weeks ago, we tried this out for the very first time, very excited about this, trying this out in a, in a patient. So we, we put the, these little plastic tubes under the skin here, under local anesthetic, 
and then we can just deploy this plastic tube, leave it for a month, and then that patient is due to have islet cells placed inside that little tube at a month when, there's, when the new blood, blood vessels are formed. So here's an example of research in motion happening experimentally in the lab and moving to patients. And that's why it's so wonderful to be able to work at the University of Alberta and the University of Alberta Hospital and with the University Hospital Foundation. So we've been working hard to try to see if we can reduce the risk for patients. The immunosuppressive drugs, the anti-rejection drugs are needed to, pre to prevent the rejection of any organ transplant, like a, a heart, a lung, a, a liver, or a kidney. Well, in our case, we also have to give these anti-rejection drugs today for an islet cell transplant, and they do carry some potential risks too. So here's Bob exchanging his insulin injections for just a few pills every day. But those pills carry risk of cancer, they carry risk of infection, and they also have potential side effects on, on, on the kidney. So if we could avoid those drugs, perhaps we could move forward and treat children and treat those that have less severe forms of diabetes. So here's another trial, for example, that we've been moving forward with, that living immunosuppression using what are called Tregs. So these are cells that are in the patient's blood, and we can extract them, expand them over the course of time, over a two-week period with our laboratory collaborators in, in San Francisco, ship these cells back to the patient, and then use a quarter dose of the anti-rejection drugs. This is an, an example of, a, of an ongoing trial that looks to be uh, promising. Well, with islet transplantation, if I was starting a new program today, I think I'd wonder why. I think, well, we've provided proof of concept that cell transplants can work clearly. We've shown that the islet transplants with the Edmonton Protocol are effective and can change patients' lives. But we clearly need to do this. We need to fix the source of cells so that we have a limitless source of cells, not be dependent on organ donors. And we need to see if we can lessen and eliminate the need for the anti-rejection drugs. Paul Lacey again. From my standpoint... There are two problems that still remain. One of them is to be able to transplant the islets without the need for a continuous immunosuppression. The second major problem, from my standpoint, is the source of islets, the continued supply of islets. How are you going to do this? Well, looking at that runway and seeing how much room there is left on the runway for landing for, for islets, we recognize that there are a number of other opportunities and approaches that can be used. Fixing the islet supply, how are we going to do that? Well, a number of years ago, in 1994, a friend and colleague who's recently passed, Carl Groth, tried an experiment in patients receiving kidney transplants. He placed some pig islets under the kidney when he transplanted these and found that he was able to detect functioning pig kidneys, pig islet producing cells for 300 days in, in these, these patients, a remarkable first experiment. So some people believe that maybe the pig islet would be the way forward. And a number of companies have moved forward now to edit the genes inside the pig to see if they can make them more compatible. And there's a, this is the field that's also moving quite uh, rapidly and, and exciting that, to see that there is indeed progress. Here's a, a an, oh, this is a complex, so this is an organ donor who's receiving a, a pig kidney transplant and it was transplanted into the leg arteries and it survived and functioned for over uh, over 56 hours which would never have been possible before without these kind of gene edits so a lot of progress is occurring and some of you will have heard this on the on the national news that is the heart of a genetically engineered pig the organ looks perfect so this was transplanted into a, into a, a patient who wasn't eligible for a heart transplant otherwise, and that heart continued to function for about three weeks or so until the patient died. So a lot of progress, still not perfect, but a lot of progress. Well, we've turned our attention to a different route, which is to use stem cells to make new islets, which almost seemed impossible some years ago. And we've been very fortunate in working with some Canadian scientists, other scientists in the United States, and, and across, right across coast to coast in Canada that have made major contributions to the stem cell field and allowed this to be uh, possible.
We've worked with a company called uh, Viasite that's made an embryonic stem cell islet. And what they did essentially is copy what happens in the body in a tiny embryo as it grows and grows a pancreas. It takes 27 days to do that. And they figured out all the growth factors that would be needed to do that to make these what are called what they called stage four cells. So about eight years ago, we walked down the corridors of the uh, level three in the university hospital, the, the operating rooms, uh, working with the nursing staff and all the teams, we were able to implant patients with some of these very early stem cells and these have shown some very promising uh, early results this was a trial that then moved forward into a number of different centers and we were able to publish last year the finding that about a third of patients receiving these kind of stem cells were able to have measurable insulin in the bloodstream and this seemed to be very safe with no major safety concerns Another company called Vertex uh, transplanted uh, these same kind of embryonic stem cells into the liver the same way like we transplant uh, patients. And this first patient treated there uh, was able to come off insulin at about 270 days after receiving these kind of uh, uh, embryonic stem cell islets. More recently, we've been working with Viasite again uh, and another company called CRISPR Therapeutics to use gene-edited uh, embryonic stem cell human uh, islet cells. And what we've done now is transplanted again in the operating rooms at the University Hospital just a few weeks ago, uh, placing these devices under the skin of, of, of patients on, on the tummy wall and in, uh, sometimes in the forearm. And this is the very first patient in the world to receive a, a, a CRISPR gene edited islet uh, stem cell uh, product. Very exciting to be part of this and to allow it to move forward. But my own laboratory has been exceedingly interested in the possibility of making patients' own cells. Why do we want to make patients' own cells? If we could make patients' own cells, they wouldn't be rejected by the body. You wouldn't need the anti-rejection drugs. And this is called personalized medicine, precision health, or IPS, inducible pluripotent stem cells. So is this possible? Well, in the old days, it seemed like alchemy that you could turn, you know, some some rust into in, in, into into gold, and and this is actually possible. And the reason why it's possible is Professor Shinya Yamanaka's contribution to science. He found that these four factors were the keys to unlocking an adult cell, and he was able to turn skin cells in the dish, human skin cells, into beating heart cells in the dish. A remarkable finding that was published around 10, 10 12 years ago. So we've been working now to use those same kind of approaches to make patients own stem cells and then turn them into islet cells using the same kind of growth factor uh, process that, that I showed you before that Viasite used. And put very, very simply, we will replace the broken parts in a patient, the islet cells, with new ones made from that patient's own bloodstream. That's what we're trying to do here in an incredibly exciting research. Take a blood sample, make these IPS cells, turn them into islet cells, and then put them back into the patient so they no longer need insulin. This will provide us an unlimited supply of cells, patients' own cells, that would avoid the need for those anti-rejection drugs. So how are we going to do this? We've been working in the lab tirelessly day and night for the last three or four years now, improving and optimizing these kind of protocols. They're very complicated. It takes 27 days to get from this point to this point, stage six, with a lot of growth factors that have to be added, precise, precision delivered every single day very, very costly, each of these agents. And we've been able now to, to move this forward in our stem cell lab. These are what are called vertical wheel bioreactors, special kind of spinning uh, culture vessels where we can culture these cells, where we can make human IPS cells from the blood. And then we can add those growth factors and turn these into human islet producing cells. And this is the team that does that. This is uh, Nadish Dadich on, on the right and Nirea and Brolio and Ila and, and Kevin and, and Heidi and Rina and others are very much part of this team. And they've been able to make these human islets from the blood. Uh, and we, it's amazing when you watch these in, in, in time-lapse photography, you can watch these colonies of, of, of IPS cells growing. And then we can make them into islets over the course of this time. And they really do work. They uh, can be purified in different ways. I won't go through too much of the science of that. But when we transplant those human islets into mice, we can reverse the diabetes fully when we do that. Now the goal is to move this forward into patients to make a safe product made from their own blood, transplant it and allow it to function just like we've done before with the Edmonton protocol. And we really believe this can happen. 
there's been immense progress in science, translational science. And by 2040, it's estimated by Deloitte that 40% of healthcare spending will be spent on cure-based therapies. Think about all these advances that have happened exponentially over the course of time. Think about your mobile phone. In the old days, it used to be a, a, a brick that you carry around or, or a suitcase. And now we have phones on our wrists. We have tiny little phones that can, and the, the double doubling in number every every 48 months. So progress is possible. The industrial revolution happened a long time ago. Scientific revolution moved forward. Now we can have robots helping us in the lab manufacture these kind of cells to help the technicians so they don't have to work all day and all night uh, doing these kind of jobs. We can use this kind of laser techniques that a company called Selino has developed to clean up the stem cells and help us pick them in an appropriate way. We can scale up this from mice to, to the first human trials and move this forward with technology that already exists. I was talking to a company this morning uh, called Tree Frog uh, Therapeutics in, in Bordeaux in France, and they have a technique that can generate vats of cells that can grow like this to generate uh, stem cells. And we're going to work with them and others to see how we can advance this field. Here's another company called Lonza Therapeutics that has this beautiful machine that is able to basically grow humanized uh, cells in an automated way. And we can envisage a room full of these in a personalized medicine orchard that could grow human cells exactly what, exactly what we need for regenerative medicine, not just for diabetes, but for many other regenerative medicine conditions as well. So I hope I've given you a spark of hope this afternoon that this is possible, that we in Alberta can be very much part and in fact lead, leading edge in moving it forward to the next phase and first testing in patients. I'm very, very excited about this. There is a new dawn, a bright new day coming for patients with diabetes, and it won't always depend on insulin injections and complications. I think we can change the face of diabetes with these kind of therapies. I really believe that this will happen. We will have the impact. We'll generate an unlimited supply of these cells will be able to transplant them safely without the need for anti-rejection drugs, that these cells will produce insulin and will be a functional cure for patients with diabetes, making it possible to deliver this patients for all. What will this bring back to Alberta? It will improve patients' quality of life. It will reduce massive strains on our healthcare system. It will eliminate and control the diabetes, dreaded diabetes complications. And this will be a massive contribution by the University Hospital Foundation to a cure for this disease. Now, the UHS have helped us in many different ways. This is a machine that we use now routinely in the clinic for liver transplantation, a machine that keeps livers alive uh, for over 24 hours. And we've been very pleased with the progress and the support that the University Foundation has been able to provide to this program. So I just want to say an immense thank you to the University Hospital Foundation this afternoon for helping us, and we're really excited to take this with you uh, to the next phase. Thank you, Dr. Shapiro, for that very amazing presentation. Um, I think I'm not the only one who's very excited to hear more during our Q&A. My name is Shannon Dieth. I'm a member of the development team here at the University Hospital Foundation. I'll be the moderator for today's question and answer period. If you have a question, you can submit your question by clicking on that Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. And uh, I think we've already seen some questions coming through. So let's get started. Um, first question, uh, this sounds too good to be true. What obstacles does your research still have to overcome to be successful? Well, the biggest obstacle right now, honestly, is, is, is funding. These are incredibly expensive experiments to do. We are laser focused in moving this forward to patients, but we can't do that without, without funding and support. We've, we've been successful with some grants from the Canadian Stem Cell Foundation, from the Juvenile Diabetes Foundation, but these help us, but they're not enough. And that's why we, that's why we, we need the help. So that's probably our biggest obstacle. Next is how do we make sure that the cells are clean enough and safe enough to put into a patient's liver in a place that can't easily be, be removed. So that's why we're doing all this testing now in the lab to make sure that there's no what we call off-target growth or, or any other concerning cells that could pop up as we, as we make these uh, new islets. Great, thank you. Uh, question from Jordy. This sounds very promising and I've been watching from the sidelines for years but with the iPS cells, how do you counter the autoimmunity that killed off the islet cells in the first place, in particular for type 1 diabetes? Yeah, so that's, that's a really great question. So the question is, 
if we transplant the patient's own cells back in into a patient with type 1 diabetes, will they survive or will they be destroyed by the immune system just like the first cells were? Well, that is a potential concern. It would not be a concern for patients with type 2 diabetes, and that will certainly be a, a focus for, for cell therapy in the, in the near future. We'll be able to deliver transplants quite, quite effectively in patients with type 2 diabetes and, or in those patients that have had surgery where the pancreas has had to be removed. But in patients with type 1, we will probably need some some kind of adjunct. And that's why we've been testing in patients now for the last four or five years in an in cl ongoing clinical trial, a way to reset the immune system to prevent that autoimmunity from happening. And it's looking to be very promising. It's one of many different approaches that can be used. Another is to gene edit the cells to make them less susceptible to immune attack. Another is to give not the full dose anti-rejection drugs, but a low dose of anti-inflammatory medication uh, that would also prevent the autoimmunity coming back. It's something that will have to be addressed, I think, in patients with type 1 diabetes. It's a very important question. Great. Next question we have. Uh, what is the age range are you looking at to start the new phase of transplantation? And I guess more broadly, does this support all diabetes patients? Yes, yeah, so, so we would begin in 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 adult patients because we don't we, this is a new frontier we've we've not tested this before we want to be sure it's safe so we don't want to expose children initially until we have some reasonable confidence that what we're doing is safe and effective so that that's going to be my number one goal and typically uh, for trials like this we'd have an age range of between 18 and 65 and that that would be typical for any new research uh, approach but we anticipate moving beyond the very first patients treated that this will be a very effective therapy for children be a very effective uh, therapy for adults of all ages for, that have type 1 and particularly type 2 diabetes you know, I'm going to jump forward to a different question that I had seen since we were talking about the trials, and, and that is, what is the criteria for patients who are interested in getting involved in the trials? Well, right now, we're, we're not quite at the stage where we're starting those trials. We do, we do offer islet transplantation with the Edmonton Protocol, but for that, you have to have a very particular niche, a particular kind of diabetes that is difficult to control despite every effort that the, the doctors and, and teams taking care of the patients have can't, can't stabilize in any other way. So that's about 5 to 10% of the patients with type 1 diabetes. The reason we're selected with that is because I mentioned before the potential risks with the anti-rejection drugs. If we could demonstrate that this is safe and effective, we wouldn't have to be so selective. So right now we're, we're testing patients with type 1, testing patients with type 2 diabetes and manufacturing cells on a one by one basis, just really for our experiments, uh, small small numbers. Uh, we're not ready to, to activate the, the trials and take it forward to Health Canada and get ethical approval just yet. But that's that's the focus of the research in, in, in the next year, to move it from where we are right now in the lab to testing in the, in the first patients. Excellent. Great. Um, Joanne is asking, can this be used for diabetics that are not on insulin? So a patient with diabetes that's not on insulin, potentially it could. I think, I think it all depends on the safety. We, we're going to target patients first that are going to benefit the most. And those that benefit the most will be those that are difficult to control or requiring insulin or, or children where it's a huge burden uh, intervention to manage diabetes second by second, day and night. Uh, but I think in the future, we could potentially increase a, a patient's islet mass who... who need some, but not the full quantity of islets. And we're not quite there yet. I think that would be a sort of secondary aim once we've shown that this is this works, it's safe and it's effective. Great, thank you. Erin uh, is asking, do you know or have a possible timeline for getting this out to the public? And so I guess kind of backtracking a bit to what you were talking about before, maybe give us an idea of where your research is at. And you mentioned a year till clinical trials, but yeah, if you could give us a bit of a timeline, that'd be wonderful. Yeah, so the sort of projecting timelines is always a dangerous thing. You, you can see immediately what's what's what the task ahead is, what what's what's before you know is what what has to be done tomorrow, what has to be done next week. We can't always predict what the challenges are going to be months and, and years ahead. Obviously, so I, I think I, the way I look upon this is, what have we achieved so far? Well, within a very short space of time, literally two, three years, we've been able to move an idea into proof that it could work in, 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 in mice with, with human islets. 
made from blood. That 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 is established. So now, what? How do we move that into into a patient? It's, it's going to take at least a year to get all the regulatory approvals and show that we can do this uh, safely. And then it's going to be a case of testing patients one by one, and proving that what we've achieved in mice also is, is the case in in patients. I anticipate it will be, but without doing those studies, we we won't know. And while we're doing that, at the same time, in parallel, if you if you will, we're going to work with these industries to see how we might scale up this process for the longer term. Now that we won't anticipate treating hundreds and thousands of patients in, in the first months and first few years of, of moving this forward, but as we move forward, there will be also incredible advances in the in in engineering in in automation that will allow this to be available for all that that's going to happen the question there is how long and I, without a crystal ball i can't answer that fully all right fair enough i know it puts you on the spot there but thank you for that uh, and marie's wondering what is the anticipated cost to get the project over the finish line yeah well, another tough that, one for you <laughs> that's, that's a hard one because uh, you know I, th I think at some point industry will take over and we won't have to worry about the cost anymore but we're not there i think at this point we have to prove the seed of an idea and show that it works and then we can move it forward so you know i i think that this project to take it from where we are right now to being able to treat hundreds of patients maybe you know hundreds of patients probably going to cost 20 20 million dollars now we don't need 20 million dollars to get this the seed going but we will need that kind of funding as we begin to escalate this up great thank you I think you touched on a really important point there. A lot of the time these projects are started with philanthropic dollars and taken over by industry once they really get the ball rolling. So thank you for that. Um, Rebecca is asking, and we touched on this a little bit, I think, but Rebecca is asking, will the first human trials be on adults or children? So you did talk about children a bit. What perhaps are the differences in working with one age group of patient versus the other? And also just a comment, so exciting and thanks for all your work. Thank you very much. So, so I think you know it's easy for us to work on adults because we, we have to worry in children about proper informed consent, or if it's assent, or if it, if, it, if it's uh, surrogate consent from from a parent, and and also you know as we move forward with the very first patients, just like those very brave patients like like Brent and, and Nina and others that, that came forward for the islet transplants under the Edmonton protocol initially, we couldn't tell them what the risks were. We told them there were potential risks. And the same thing's going to apply here. There's going to be potential risks at, at the beginning, and over the course of time, we'll know those risks very precisely. And as we know them more precisely, we can then justify and, and move forward to children. I mean, we carry out transplants in children, life-saving transplants today where it's needed. Uh, and we will, I'm sure, carry out cell transplants in children uh, for, di for diabetes. But I think we have to start somewhere. And the safest place to start is, is with an adult population that can be as well informed as we possibly can about the potential risks and benefits. Yes, very good. Tom is asking, wouldn't a patient's own stem cells still come up against the autoimmune response that caused type 1 diabetes in the first place? So I think we already answered that. That's, that's the, same, the, the, same, the same issue about autoimmunity and being able to control it. And we'll need some adjunctive strategies that we're already working on to try to control that. All right. Um, someone is asking, what about type 2 diabetes? I went through remit study with success has started ozempic probably pronounced that wrong so so for type 2 diabetes i think absolutely this is going to be a a, a, a game changer for patients with type 2 diabetes cell transplant at this point has not been delivered to patients with type 2 but i'm sure that if we deliver enough cells it will be highly effective excellent right bobby is asking uh no that's We've just answered that one. So Noah's asking, what is the percentage of risk of anti-rejection drug side effects? Okay, well, the, the, the risks of the anti-rejection drugs um, are variable. The, um, you know, the, we, we have thousands of patients that, that need an organ transplant and are alive today, thousands upon thousands of patients are alive today because they, they have an organ transplant, a kidney, a liver, a heart, a lung, other organ, organs. 
but but they need they need it and they have to take their anti-rejection drugs so these are relatively safe but we know that there are a slightly increased risk of infections there's a slightly increased risk of cancers most of those cancers are surface cancers on the skin that can be easily dealt with but they're not ideal for somebody that has perfectly stable diabetes control so we we recognize there are potential risks. There's another condition called lymphoma, which is kind of cancer that develops in around 1% of patients that have an organ transplant. So we want to minimize those kind of risks, eliminate them essentially by this kind of approach. Thank you. Um, I think it, we probably touched on this, my apologies if it's just reworded in a different way, but throughout Canada, will, the, will this procedure that is done for everyone with type one in any, any hospital in the future. So I think what they're asking is, will this be used across Canada? And I think you touched on that and hopefully even beyond. Well, I think it will. I, I think we haven't really thought of, you know, fully about how the model will, we, we know how it will begin. We just don't know how it'll end. So we, we know we'll, we'll start one by one, treating one patient after another, after another, and showing that what we believe will happen actually will happen real real life data in real life patients now the question long term is how do we scale this up and deliver it in will it be centralized to a few hospitals i think it probably will be will the laboratories be centralized that manufacture the patient's own cells i'm sure they will be because it's certainly a complex process even even when it's automated so i anticipate that there'll be hubs where the where the cells will be manufactured and then the, the patient's own cells will be shipped to the hospital and they can easily be transplanted in a in a local hospital where there's existing expertise in being for example able to deploy cells into the liver excellent Linda's wondering, can a parent donate islet cells to their adult son? Or yeah, is that so, considered the Edmonton protocol? Yeah, so we've actually done that, uh, not in Edmonton, but, but but I was part of a team that did that in, in Kyoto in Japan, where we took a, a, a living donor and we transplanted half the cells inside the pancreas into a, a person that had diabetes, and it, and it was quite uh, successful. But it's a surgery that we don't want to do unless it's absolutely necessary in terms of taking away half the pancreas. But if you were to take away uh, some cells and, and manufacture the islets, uh, islets from the cells, then that's a reasonable thing to do because, because taking a blood sample is, is a very safe thing to do. Now, it would be better though to have your own cells rather than having cells from your parent where there's a, uh, they're still slightly foreign. So uh, I think we'll st we're still gonna focus on, on making these islets from patient's own blood. Excellent. Thank you. Melanie says, you mentioned that the growth factors required in creating islet cells from stem cells are quite expensive. Is it more cost effective than what is spent currently on diabetic care? Well, the way I look upon that is that the development phase for any new therapy, when you're really at the cutting edge like this, uh, it, it's exceedingly expensive at the beginning. And I can give you an example. So CAR T cell therapy that's used today routinely for the treatment of certain uh, blood cancers and other cancers in, in children and adults used to cost one to two million dollars per patient. And now these same kind of CAR T cells can be manufactured locally by hospitals uh, for about a hundred thousand dollars a patient. I think the same kind of approach will apply with these new stem cell therapies. At the very beginning, they're going to be expensive. As it's proven and as it becomes routine, the costs will reduce massively. All right, thank you. Another question here is, if there is to be a malignant side effect from the stem cell transplant, is it likely to happen or form in the first few years after the implant, or is it something that could happen decades from now? Yeah, so that, you know, you're asking me a question that we can't answer because we've never studied this in patients for months and years. Is it likely? We haven't found any malignant cells in any in any of the samples that we've ever tested. And, and that same thing applies over the last eight, nine, 10 years with the studies that we've done with Viacite with the embryonic stem cell uh, derived uh, islet product. So we've never found a malignant transformation. So I, I'm less worried about that one than I am the risk of a contaminating cell, say making a cyst or making a, 
an off-target cell that wouldn't be a cancer so much as just a cell that we don't want in there. Thank you. Um, another question here is, um, will the admission protocol still be used? And this one is, I suppose that obviously it's still going to be used currently until this new research comes to, to play, but do you think there'll also be a time where, you know, both procedures are happening in conjunction? Well, I think at the beginning, because we, we won't be able to deliver this to hundreds of patients, there'll just be a few patients that'll be eligible for the very first trials. Now, it'll be a, a test phase. And then as the test moves forward, then we have to ask the question, how practical is it to increase the su supply and amplify the, the processes? And as we make progress there, and I think gradually uh, this will uh, overtake and eventually replace the need for the Edmonton Protocol. But that's not going not to happen immediately. I guess I'm going to add on to that one. Do you think, do you see past patients that have received the Edmonton Protocol, do you see them receiving this new procedure and, not, and no longer needing anti-rejection? Funnily enough, I was talking to an islet transplant patient in clinic this morning, and that's exactly the question they asked me. Would I be eligible when, when this kind of therapy reaches prime time and it's available? Would I be eligible? Well, yes, absolutely. We would then be able to wind down the need for the anti-rejection drugs and replace the the islet cells that came from an organ donor with your own cells, that, that, that would be technically possible, uh, but somewhat down the road. Okay, excellent. Well, I think at this point, we can wind down the question and answer period. And I just wanna thank you so much for taking the time to meet with us and uh, answer all our questions. And I'll now turn it back to Carolyn and she'll have some closing comments for us. Excellent, thank you, Shannon. And really all I can say is wow. And what an incredible journey we've been on today. Um, I hope you've all enjoyed it as much as we had have. And um, throughout the Q&A, there were some questions that came in asking how, the, how you can donate to research. So how you can is right on the screen before you. So please take note of the phone number and the email. And I certainly look forward to, uh, to hearing from you and uh, appreciate in advance your support for this amazing research. And now on behalf of the University Hospital Foundation, including Dr. Jody Abbott, Shannon, Emily, and myself, and of course, our very special guest, Dr. James Shapiro, thank you for your time and your active participation. As I said earlier, and within the next few days, we will send you a, a short a survey to let us know how we did today, as well as the recording from today's expedition. So if you do want to learn more about us, please reach out by email or visit our website at give to uhf.ca. While we are pausing our virtual expeditions over the summer, I certainly hope you will join us in September when they start up again. You can also watch recordings from our past virtual expeditions at the University Hospital Foundation's YouTube, chair, the YouTube channel. And as Dr. Shapiro mentioned earlier, ongoing funding from our community is vital to ensuring the work of innovators in our community can continue to make breakthrough, advance patient care and improve health in the communities we serve and around the world. Thank you so very much for joining us today. And this includes our presentation. We, we do leave you with a short video entitled Ignite 2030. Thanks everybody and have a lovely evening.